Okay, I want to thank you guys for all coming in to hear our speaker tonight. Uh, it's kind of a pleasure. This is the first speaker that IMS has ever hosted, so I hope this is the first of many speakers that we can bring in to share their experiences with us and their knowledge. Tonight we've got Ross coming in. I'm going to let him introduce himself in a second, but Ross is one of our alumni. And it's always nice when we can bring in some of our graduates to come in and talk to you. And Ross is really excited about this. He wanted to come here because he wants to share with you. So I'm just, I'm just, you don't want to hear me. You guys hear me all the time. So Ross, why don't you take it away, tell them a little bit about yourself and then start your presentation. Hi, everyone. My name is Ross Shabilsky. I am the uh, director of Flash Development for Reflection Software and manager of e Studios LLC. To start, just give me a little bit of a background on my humble origin here at North Central College. I graduated in the class of 2005. I was one of the web dudes, as we were called, a team of students that devoted themselves to developing, creating, maintaining, and adding flair to the North Central College website. I was the creator of our original tour, which I'm proud to see uh, amongst all the website changes that have occurred over the years, still stands to this day. And um, it was here in this experience where I learned the software that really forever changed my life and my career path. So I just want to kind of take a moment to express gratitude for that experience because it was a small thing that led to a lifelong change and something that was really meaningful in my life and I brought me to where I am today. Um, so again, here's just some background. Um, I've been developing with Flash now for over 10 years. In my experience, I have served as an artist, a designer, a uh, development engineer. I've connected with clients and offered guidance on projects. And I also lead our team at Reflection Software in the production of interactive e-learning software. Today I'm also the manager of my own company. It's called D20 Studios, LLC. We're a design, develop, and interactive cross-platform multiplayer game called Hero Games. I also develop resources to aid in mobile development and multi-screen application development in Flash. My goals for today are two parts. One, I'd like to share how I got started with game development and how I used Flash to create this multi-platform game. Two, I'd like to explain some specific techniques that members of our audience here in the animation class and computer science classes can take away and use going forward with your own projects and creating your own games. So how did this all get started? The dream to become a game designer. While I've been a long, lifelong hobbyist, a uh, fan of tabletop strategy games, D&D, Magic the Gathering, you name it, I was a duper nerd. And I'm proud to share that fact. <laughs> what this started as um, was a dream to kind of take all these different interesting games I had and combine them into a singular um, game to play with your friends in a short time span. Because a lot of these games have real lux in excess of 80 pages. And you'll quickly discover as you finish college, you grow up, you have a family, you have a job, that your time span to play games goes like this. And there's not much time left to really you know, partake in those hobbies. So this was a means to kind of get together with my friends and still have these experiences that we used to have together, um, albeit in a short time span. The original goal I had was to create an actual physical board game. And I play tested the prototype you can see here on the screen for about a year, refining rules and making it optimized and faster paced and more fun. Um, finally, I actually had it professionally reviewed, and it did very well in terms of you know, the prototype quality and the game's you know, experience was solid, but it just kind of lacked a essential marketing element to make it stand out to potential publishers. So, having felt that I had failed in my quest, I was a bit dismayed. Um, a friend of mine actually suggested, you know, you've been a programmer for how long now? You know, the, the big hit these days is 
to web games, why not take the experience that you gained and apply that toward making this game into a browser-based game? And having heard him say that, I thought to myself, you know, that's, that's a pretty good idea. But it was, it was a bit daunting. I mean, my program experience has been very specifically geared toward web, um, you know, e-learning, and not anything that was particularly in making a game. There's a lot that goes into it. Because this is the type of game that doesn't just succeed because you know, it's a single player experience. It's, it's a multiplayer game. It's designed to connect with people. And what the most fun from this game comes from sharing the experience of basically uh, battling and eliminating your friends. And so after some time, I put thought into it and said, you know, this is something I think I could do. And uh, today I'm proud to share that um, nearly six years after the fact I started this journey, um, I can show you this. This is the Hero Mages website, where any player can essentially go onto this website right now and click on the big play button to launch this game. going on there, I'm going to also take in point of the fact that I'm going to be demoing the same game on an iPad and on my Android smartphone. So we're just going to take a minute here to log in. I'll start on the iPad here, so here I am on my iPad, I move my character out there, move another one out there, some freaky monster, and there you go, that's the idea. And so the goal is that you take your team of heroes and you fight and eliminate all your friends in a bloody fight to the death. iPad, PC, Android, running on all of them. So how did we get here? <clears throat> oh, that's right, achievements. So where did this take me? First off, um, technical, technical excellence in the 2010 Indie Club Mobile Contest. Finalist for Best Mobile Game in 2012 Independent Propeller Words. Over 8,000 registered players to date and counting. The game was featured as a new and noteworthy game in the Apple App Store. And I've sold over 1,000 units since the launch two weeks ago. <laughs> and add, the, add one additional piece to this. Um, just about a half hour ago, I signed a publishing agreement for a 4 game version. So I will be fulfilling my original dream to take it to tabletop. Yeah. share with you my three steps for success how I got here. Number one, choose the right tools for the job. Number two, focus on one challenge at a time. Three, most important, never give up. And 
tying all these pieces together here is, of course, the golden rule. Let passion motivate. Because we don't have passion for what we do, we'll never, we'll never get this far. What it takes to build a game like this and go to experience on top of having a family, having friends, doing a full-time job, going to school, it's a lot. And you need to have something more than money and more than dreams of success and what you have to care about what it is you're doing. Of course, you have my cool minutes are going to be excited, so let's get pumped up. Minutes <laughs> so, talk about the tools. Why Flash? Why Flash? Two main reasons here. One, the tool set allows you to have both a very diverse coding environment, shown at the top here, where you can create action script classes and program with a strong type language. And two, it also includes a visual environment. So all of your artwork assets, animation, interface prototyping design can be done in the same program. This is extremely effective for creating what I like to call the ideal developer artist workflow, where you, the developer, or the artist as it may be, can work seamlessly with your team of artists or with the artist and developer. When I developed this game, I was a single person doing both design and development. And while I'm pretty good at art in some respects and did develop some of the icons and interface designs, there was a lot of things I couldn't do. Creating character animations, for one, illustrations, tile sets, these kind of things. So what I did was contract out artwork. And it was very important during the cycle that we had a means to both communicate our work back and forth and develop them with a similar mindset. And Flash provided that by giving us a means to create development assets within the development environment while I could simultaneously be working on code, functions, control those animations within the game. Workflow, pretty simple. I would define some specifications, as you see at the top here. Send over to the artist what I expect in terms of graphic designs, what kind of animations the character would have, how many frames the animation would take. And in return, they deliver back assets and say, Here's your artwork, here's your animations, how does this all work? And then we can kind of have a back and forth where we can discuss changes as need be. It was also very effective because particular artists I work with were able to understand a lot of the technical needs I had. So beyond just simply creating animations, they were also working with me to help create things that would allow seamless uh, transition of team oriented colors. For example, uh, the game you just saw there, there was different colors purple, green, orange. There's a lot of players in the board. We need to have a way to distinguish whose guys were whose. So, one of the things we did was in the artwork code, we set up places where we could define particular clothing that could be singled out as this is my team. And here's the big one, and this is the thing that's really impressive about the Flash. It exports to everything. Windows, Mac, Linux, iOS, Android, Blackberry. Your way is successfully launched in the web browser, giving access to any players via the PC web browser, the Mac browser, or the Linux browser. It's also being sold right now in the Google Play Market, Amazon, you can get on your Nook, you can get on your Kindle, and of course your, your iPad or your iPhone, all these markets. I don't know a single line of C-sharp. I, I could not tell you how to even begin programming C-sharp, or Java for that matter. How did I do all this stuff as a single person? I used Flash. And by writing my project in these ActionScript files, piling out, all I had to do, literally, to create these different platforms was change my export site to say Android, iOS, whatever I wanted to say. And so it made the process very effective at putting these platforms out there. Um, there was some work, of course, involved with getting market agreements. There's specific things to set up in terms of provisioning with the iTunes store. But beyond that, it was a seamless transition from code to device. And I'm also proud to say that every version that runs at Hero Mages is running using the exact same source code. So there's only one version of the game that's out there. It's not going to have a specific web version. Results. One cycle, 
to rule them all. Here we have my laptop. There's the phone again. This is a Sony tablet on the left there, an iPad. And this little guy over here, very interesting, is a Sony dual screen tablet. The uh, application is actually set up for multi-screen, so it'll detect multiple uh, screens and device and then allocate itself accordingly. So you have your login here, there's a little quote from one of the characters, something that goes here, and during the actual gameplay, it'll actually utilize both screens for gameplay as well. So I'll create the game engine. We're going to talk about the uh, stuff I started before. Everything, or the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And I cannot tell you how true this statement is. So what I just showed you looked pretty daunting. One person creating all these games, how the heck do you even get your head wrapped around starting something like that? Well, what I actually started creating was nothing like that. What I started creating was this fancy guy here. This is a simple engine that allows you to carry out the most basic game tasks, moving around on a two-dimensional grid. And literally all this consists of array represented visually in the graph with some simple mechanics for shuffling around little circles. And it was the completion of this tool here that really sparked the motivation to carry on and move forward with the project because you can't take that first step and get your head out of the idea of it's impossible, it's overwhelming, it's something I just can't do, then you're never going to get anywhere. You just have to start somewhere. And this was my summer. choices, 
and it executes the best choice. That's it. And as strange as that may sound, just having that simple piece of knowledge in my brain was enough for me to begin figuring out what I need to do to actually program music. And this is what your like your major player is saying about the game right now. That AI is brutal. <laughs> I've been playing this for days without being able to win a single battle. Is it me, or is this game seriously skewed in difficulty to impossible? Mm -hmm. I hoped at best to make an AI that was adequate, that would shuffle around like zombies. And now I have people giving me one star reviews because the game is too hard. <laughs> in the background here, and I'm very proud of this slide because everybody looks cool and they've got their engineering statistics overlaid with cool text, is, uh, is a flowchart actually that kind of talks through some of the different specific projects. So in addition to following those three steps, what I did was organize the AI's task into groups. And so it may be a little hard to see here, but it starts with a simple analysis you know, is my main character alive or is it dead? And then based on that decision, it kind of breaks down into, okay, well, if he's alive, what can I do with myself? Can I attack, can I heal? And then it goes down the list and just effectively chooses actions, ranks them in terms of statistical probability, so which will give you the best result of damage, will probably get you killed, and then decide what to do. So there you have it. Yeah. Your eventual task of programming a StarCraft II AI, simplify it down to three steps, and program by itself. Let's take another example, and this is for our artists out here that are looking to increase their skills as an animator and take their skills to the next level of making games. One of the biggest challenges of creating your made is moving to mobile, aside from the fact that it was awesome, I could just export out there, was that uh, the graphics were, had to be optimized specifically to run a mobile device. Uh, initially, I worked with Pure Vector Graphics, uh, which are awesome because you can scale them to any size and dimension within the browser. Uh, and I took and put these to the mobile device, it didn't do that. It said, I can't handle this, I'm going to give it two frames per second. Tough. And so there was a, a, a long phase of figuring out, well, how do I take and make these graphics playable on a mobile device? And the key was experimenting with different techniques and finding the one that worked best for the game. The more knowledge you have on the technical side of development, the more value becomes for perspective companies. And I put this in here because when I was talking to Professor Rank, actually, we got to talk about in our class, whether this kind of information would be valuable to you guys. And one of the phrases that came up with is, well, artists just, you know, they don't really want to get involved with the technical side. They don't really care about what it what is or what the code's about. Um, and I, I, just, I want to put this out there because I think that this is something that you should embrace. Yes, it may be outside the realm of pure artistic creativity, but it's something that if you can grasp these terms and understand how to connect with other developers, you become all the more valuable as an artist and as a creator. And you become a team member that studios like me are going to seek out. And that's precisely why I chose to work with the art team that I did. So what does a typical developer artist communication look like, particularly with Flash? Well, if I say things to you like frames, duration, color, perspective, effects, you probably come back and say, yeah, I got that. I've been to our cool art school. I know, what, I know what's going on there. Libraries, folder, movie clips, vector scaling. Yeah, OK, that sounds, you know, I think I get that. That's right. And then I throw out some terms like blitting, sprite sheets, texture atlas. And in most cases, that's where I lose artists. They'll say, what are you talking about? I don't know what that is. How do we begin? So, my point here is become a tech savvy artist. Know what to expect from developers when you're working on a professional project, and know how to optimize your work so that when you deliver it, the developer doesn't have to do any reworking to get your pieces optimized for the product. So, what we're going to talk about now are three different rendering techniques I experimented with during the creation <coughs> of the mobile version of AirMages. The first one has been around for ages probably the very first type of video game right if there was, called Blitty. Now, most Flash animation is done with a timeline-based thing. You have graphics kind of work together in a, in a series and on a timeline. Blitting takes the display list completely out of the picture. And the idea is you have a canvas. So a single 
bitmap is all that's on your stage. To create animations on that canvas, you have what's called a spray sheet. This represents a series of cells that each represent one frame of your animation. So here we have the barbarian who's marching along, his clothes. And what we do here is store this sprite sheet into RAM. And then we use a function called copy pixels, which is a member of the bitmap class, to take a cell of this data and basically take all the little things. It's actually kind of cool on the projector you can see the little pixels here. And just basically imagine the computer going through and taking each little square one by one and splitting it onto that canister. And there you have the barbarian on the stage. And so what's good about this is that you have outstanding performance in terms, in, in contrast to display, because copying a pixel from one piece of memory to another is extremely fast. It's easy process. So you can effectively have multiple models on stage all being shot over to this canvas, running at a very high frame rate on mobile devices. Another benefit is you can control the animation speed within the independent your time, whereas timeline animation is you know, by nature controlled by your timeline and your document speed. Blitting allows you to control this at any frame rate. So you can just set timers or loops that work independently of your main display list. Some of the disadvantages. Obviously, don't get this going, so it's confusing. Know how to do this. It is more difficult to program because you lose a lot of basic elements such as uh, being able to simply move things on the display list with your typical X and Y's or rotate or transform objects. So there's some tricks to it. Fortunately, there are engines out there that you can use that will do a lot of the thinking for you so you can kind of still work with your regular display list. But at the onset, there is some challenge here. Um, the other thing just kind of cut off here, uh, complex sprite sheets generate large overhead or overheads. And what I mean by that is that in order for Blade to be effective, you have to store your entire texture sheet in memory at one time. Because the whole benefit of the speed is that it's in random access memory, it's fast, it's ready to go for you. And you start getting more and more models, like your image, where I have, say, 21 different types of models to keep track of. And on top of that, about three to 500 frames of animation. Your memory heats up quickly. In fact, to store all that memory into your image, I think I have it heats up like 16 gigs of memory to have it all in there at one time. So while this was an effective demonstration for my game, and you know, I did learn something from trying this out, and I realized quickly this is not going to work long term. Another one, partial blitting. This idea is very similar to stage blitting, except instead of blitting to the entire canvas, you're going to have a mini canvas, represented by these little gray squares there. So what we're doing here is the mini display canvas is going to move around the stage just like your regular display objects, using your X and Y's, you can control it the time limit, shuffle it around as you see fit. And all you're going to do is blit your singular frame animation over to the canvas. And this way, you can actually rotate, transform, and leverage kind of like a cross between both the best worlds. You get your splitters and your high speed, and so you get outstanding performance, and you can also manipulate models with additional splitters. The downside is, again, you have increased file size and memory. You have to store all those spreadsheets in your program somewhere. You can't just rely on the time line to create more. And as you generate more models on the screen, your performance will also start to go up. So, third technique. This is the one that ultimately worked for me. It's called bitmap armature. The idea here is that you have a model, shown here, that's broken up into four components. And there's the body, there's I know it's kind of weird, but you know, it's from the top-down perspective, and so when he's all assembled together, he looks like a you know, generally realistic looking like this. And um, the idea is that all these pieces are independently tweened on the timeline using you know, what you're used to, regular timeline animation. So what are some cool things about this? One, you have very small file size. You can set up to store massive extra sheets of information, but you don't have to store small little pieces of data. And it's also easily customized, whereas the sprite sheet limits you to be able to customize, well, you can't really customize the cells. You have to control the whole thing at once. Um, you can actually single out pieces like we have here, a little blue sash, for example, could be a component. And I can say change this to red or orange or whatever um, The key to this, uh, because the original models were actually similar to the structure of the vector, 
was that the pieces have to be designed as dynamics. So you have to go through kind of a conversion process and scale them appropriately so that they match up with the size of your target device. And by using bitmaps, the GPU can consume them and rapidly transform them. So they can figure out the performance of all um, The performance is not as optimized as blitting. So if you're hoping to use this technique to render, say, you know, 20 models on screen at the same time, um, the other problem is that the complexity of the armature, um, as an armature gets more complex, it's going to also affect performance. Whereas with bitmaps, you can make the model as detailed or as crazy as you want to perform the same because all of you can get is But these are just three interesting tools you can use and that are good to be aware of before because there's actually um, even newer techniques coming out um, in regards to uh, flash moving forward with called State Street. It's a new GPU accelerated uh, engine that allows you to directly control animation via hardware functions. And hardware functions all leverage techniques in the sprite sheet. So essentially the idea is that the sprite sheets become a texture atlas, and then you can render out the GPU animations to your GPU with even faster speeds. We're talking upwards of 60 frames a second on high pad first generation uh, with multiple mods on screen. All right, and then lastly for the uh, artist out there, this is some considerations. So if you're a timeline-based artist, things to consider if you're trying to optimize games. Um, always be careful with using nested animation loops because the more deeper layers your animation will consist of, the more complex and memory-consuming it can be. And particularly if you're going to convert to a sprite sheet, you have to be aware of that. Ensure that your nested loop syncs up in some way with your main loop so that when you create your sprite sheet, um, they all sync up. Uh, avoid using masks in animations at all costs because they will bog down animations heavily, especially at mobile devices. Avoid broken timelines. What I mean by this is you instantiate a graphic, not uh, create a keyframe blank for it because it will have to re instantiate uh, the graphics panel. So you essentially create and destroy more graphics. Um, oh, avoid unnecessary moving parts. So don't animate things that aren't showing on the display list. Avoid alpha tweens, um, keep your scaling consistent, and for God's sakes, please use the system structure. Always organize your library and group your components together in a way that makes sense so that developers understand what your name was and the code Okay, that concludes the art portion of the presentation. Now let's get back to the business side. So, I put this in here because it's kind of an important uh, realization I think everyone can see when you start a venture like this, you should be aware of Having your own business is very hard. And particularly so when you have a wife and you have a child. And you have a child. There's a lot of things you have to juggle at once. The success of your business will depend largely upon the time you invest into it. So if you want to succeed, you have to put the time in. You have to keep developing. You have to put yourself out so for God's sake to market yourself. Start selling yourself early. Get out there. Get reviewed. I share a personal story I had um, during one of the contests I was developing for. Um, it's actually the Sony Paragraph Challenge. And I was doing multi screen work that you saw on the screen earlier. Um, my son was actually decided to be for six weeks in advance. So I had to tackle the challenge of having had, oh, say, maybe three hours of sleep the night before, having a program until like three or four in the morning. My wife suddenly realizes it's time to go to the hospital. And that was, of course, Somehow I was able to muster the strength up and get her through it and husband did my job. Um, but it just taught me something that you know, always, you know, always care, always care for your family first. And always take that a priority. And just have people in your life line to support you. It's very important. I think my wife and my mom and my friends and my family. It's, it's, it's a tough experience, and again, it's something that you have to have passion and desire to do. So make sure if this is something you want to do. I highly encourage you. You have to have a motivation that's beyond. You know, so, in conclusion, Flash is an awesome tool that empowers you both creatively and in development. 
become more valuable as an artist and as a developer by following industry trends and experimenting with new technologies around them. Don't limit yourself to what you're currently doing in the classroom. Reach out. You know, encourage each other to seek out new technologies. You know, and get your professors involved because they want to be involved in this new technology as well. There's a lot of exciting things out there. Um, one of the things that's been tossed around a lot these days is Flash is dead. HTML5 is taking over. I'm sure you've all heard that in light of the whole iPad revolution. But the truth is that Flash has actually gone a major rebranding and have now focused their tool sets entirely on Kingdom. So Flash has now become one of the number one tools available for creating games. I used it as a single person to create this entire cross-platform game. I never thought I could do it as a single person. And now you can actually leverage GPU acceleration, and people are out there right now, small teams of four people, creating games that rival the stuff you play on your Xbox. So check it out. Get involved with Virtually anything can be accomplished by taking one step at a time. If the uh, couple of examples I showed today haven't convinced you, just give it a try. If there's a challenge in your life or something you're seeking to achieve and you just seem to feel willing, put aside the end. Just focus on one step. What's one thing you can do to move towards that goal? And you will feel more empowered than you ever imagined. So just doing that first step. Because in taking the first step, you realize, hey, I'm one step closer. I can actually, this is something I can actually do. You'll feel good about yourself. You'll feel good about yourself. Finally, success is the result of endless trial. And passion is the greatest part. To this day, he remains a struggle. I am still working to the financial investment. I am getting there. It's becoming a success each day. Uh, but it's a journey that, after the end, I'm passionate about it. I do try get there one day, even if, even if your mate just never takes off and becomes the next Andrew Bird, which it probably won't, because that's just an unrealistic expectation. I at least, you know, got out there and tried, and in the process I found the box, and did the next game I wanted. So you have potential. Now, just, just keep trying, keep doing yourself. So where do we go from here? I welcome everyone to, to jot these informations down. This is my Twitter, Austin 20 Studio. Follow me and updates on my game, my flash development, and so forth. If you have questions, or say you're creating a game and want some help getting started, you might get some connections and hookups, here's my email. I'm more than happy to support you. Get you started. Um, anybody here is interested, I would be more than happy to sponsor you for that. Meet up once a month, discuss. So I welcome all of you to get involved, to take yourself to the next level, and uh, see where you go. your project in the early stages of development when it wasn't returning any money back to you just yet, uh, such as like paying for the artist and um, other development costs? Question. I paid up Okay, 
So, difficult to answer when I saw trying to give you a couple days. The uh, board game prototype from start to finish was about a year. And that includes uh, creating initial concept, uh, building the prototype materials and resources, play testing extensively, and concluding with the professional board game. The uh, development of the game engine, the initial piece of taking it to a place where I consider it playable on the web, like the first prototypers, was about six months. And then maybe another year and a half of polishing. And that's kind of the interesting part about it, is that polish will take you the majority of your time. You'll spend maybe, you know, you'll get mostly, maybe 70% of the game done in like weeks, and then the last element of adding the artwork, adding the flair, adding the polish, like really pulling the rules down, making it effective, that will be the more time. And then mobile development um, took about maybe two, four weeks, I want to say, to get the initial um, interface design transition from the web based version to mobile. I actually bought this smartphone, I think it was two and a half weeks before I built the mobile contest and cranked out interface and sent it to contest. I didn't think I'd have a chance in hell of getting anything, but I actually won technical license. Sweet, they like it. I wasn't happy because it ran about you know 12 frames per second, but they still saw the potential in it, so I was like, cool. And then it was another year or so after that really learning these techniques because um, at the time I was I just had to I know the features of the game, AI, Tori, and so there's a lot of feature development on top of it. And then the iPad version took only four months. Okay. Other questions? Are you guys have questions? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, how do you staff this thing? Oh, you know, it's just the little red button. The, the red button? Yep.